Ethereum devs decide not to delay Ethereum's difficulty bomb. So this is from, of course, Friday. And here's the summary. Well, this was written on Saturday, right? The 30th. But Ethereum's developers have decided not to delay the pending difficulty bomb as the merge of its main net to the beacon chain could still happen this summer. If all goes according to plan, Ethereum developers could be ready to fork test nets in two weeks, removing the need for the hard fork to delay the difficulty bomb. Here's what I don't understand too, because remember the, the previous call is to get, give you the rundown, is that once you start forking test nets, they are gonna have they're not gonna fork more than one every two weeks. So if in two weeks they start forking test nets, we still have eight weeks to go. That puts us at essentially mid-July, okay? So like around July 15th. By the time that happens, tra uh, the block times will be increased because of the difficulty bomb to like 20 seconds, which is way over what they had said they were willing to deal with. Remember, they said they were willing to deal with 15 seconds. So everything coming out of their mouth in these calls, everything that's getting put into, into writing as well is inconsistent with pretty much anything they've ever stated. Not surprising when we really talk about Ethereum's past in general though. I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's highly inconsistent. Uh, according to senior of Ethereum developer Tim Biko, the team has four weeks to decide on the difficulty bomb. Ethereum's developers have decided not to delay the pending difficulty bomb, at least now. Additionally, there's still a possibility of a highly anticipated merge occurring this summer. This is according to the latest Ethereum core developers meeting, meeting highlighted by Christine Kim of Galaxy Digital. She says, that, here's the recap. Devs decide not to delay the difficulty bomb. Merge still hopeful for the summer. According to the Ethereum developers, if everything goes well with the shadow fork testing, they could be ready for the remaining test nets in the next two weeks. Consequently, they will not need to carry out a hard fork to delay the difficulty bomb. Furthermore, the effects of the difficulty bomb are yet to be fully felt, as explained by Tim Biko in the following statement. Quote, the Ethereum network is not being affected today by the bomb, and it's not going to be noticeably effective uh, or affected uh, in two weeks. Realistically, we even have like four weeks to make that call. I think it's worth moving forward on testing, seeing how far we feel uh, or we are in the process in two weeks from now and looking at it then. So from, of course, Friday, the 29th, we have two weeks. So not this Friday, but next Friday, we'll get more information, I think. Obviously, like we thought before, we were going to get more information this past Friday. That didn't happen. Welcome to reporting on Ethereum news. Uh, in an earlier analysis, Ethereum's difficulty bomb was expected to start being felt on the network sometime in June or July in the scenario that the merge would not be ready. So we also need to make this clear. The, the effect on the network in this definition is only to the end users, meaning block times. The effect of the network on the miners is not necessarily anything that they've approached. Now, we aren't really necessarily feeling it super hard on the miners, especially because we had an unprecedented NFT launch, but we are starting to see difficulty slightly go up in average. Now this is, and the hash rate's not following that, okay? so. Over the next month for May, we're going to start seeing essentially artificial increase in difficulty on Ethereum. By June, provided in two weeks they don't decide to go ahead and push the difficulty bomb back, by June we are going to essentially see uh, some network of significant network effects from the mining perspective. We will start to slowly see a decrease in revenue all miners will experience this and we'll get into what that means here too as well in a second once we finish this. So in an earlier analysis, Ethereum, okay, so we got past that part. The world won't end with 21 to 25 second blocks, says Vitalik. 
I told you guys, it's been inconsistent. What we initially were understanding is they didn't want to go over 15 seconds. Now they're perfectly fine with 21 to 25 seconds. Ethereum's Vitalik Buterin was also present during the core developer call. According to his analysis, the team has to evaluate the pain of doing an extra delay hard fork versus the pain of living with 21 or 25 second blocks for a while, which is something we have done before and the world didn't end. Of course, it happened before, we talked about this before, and sure, Ethereum continued. What's the major difference here? NFT marketplace, okay? We are talking about a huge difference in the amount of transactions that are going on in ETH, the amount of money that is sunk into NFTs, and it will be a huge difference just from the end user perspective because there's so many more people you going through so many more transactions at such a higher rate, at such a higher dollar point, at such a high price that I think that Sure, it won't end, but it could spell out, in my opinion, super, super doubt within the Ethereum ecosystem. Further, expanding on Vitalik's comment, the Ethereum difficulty bomb increases the difficulty level of mining Ethereum. An increase in difficulty means that mining ETH becomes less profitable as block times increase. The difficulty bomb is part of the Ethereum network and is intended to encourage developers and miners to transition into a less energy intensive proof of stake algorithm. Let's be clear on what it really is. What it really is, is a poison pill. What it really is, is a trap to stop miners from forking Ethereum. Why would they want to stop miners from forking Ethereum? Because if miners are were successful in forking Ethereum and something goes bad with proof of stake and they get shut down for seven hours like Solana just did, and all the devs go, what the heck, this other chain that the miners forked is working perfectly fine, we're just gonna go back to that. That's what really happens. Now, of course, we already have Ethereum Classic. We've seen this in practice and it didn't come to fruition over a previous split, but that previous split didn't go from proof of work to proof of stake. It just went from proof of work to proof of work with a more centralized attitude. So there are risks here, even just from, if you're pro proof of stake, you need to understand that there are risks here that are going on. And part of that is surrounding, of course, this battle between Ethereum developers wanting to move to proof of stake and proof of work miners wanting to continue on the network due to obviously revenue driven, um, revenue driven reasons, right? So this will get really interesting really quick because here's another note that the article doesn't point out that you need to take into consideration. And that is that the amount of hash rate decrease directly will uh, in, uh, directly will impact the block times. So what does that mean? That means the more hash rate that drops off of Ethereum, the longer the block times will get. So they can say that they predict that given the current hash rate, their block times could go up to, you know, 15 seconds in June, right? But that doesn't actually play out to be true because the, the factor here is how much revenue do miners begin to lose and how much hash rate will drop off and start going to other networks as a result, thereby potentially exponentially increasing the block times in, on Ethereum very quickly. And so it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out because inevitably what will begin to happen is that miners will basically do one of two things, right? Either Ethereum starts to drop below the profitability of some other proof of work algorithm and miners start to move to that algorithm or which is definitely more likely and definitely top of the list is that Ethereum becomes unprofitable for the people that have higher electric costs. And as those electric costs basically start not or start being more than the amount of revenue that the miners are making on Ethereum, they will start ditching their GPUs and the, of course, the amount of hash rate on Ethereum will drop. 
thereby increasing block times quicker than they are estimating. So I think it's really important to take that into account. Now, Tim did say a few more things on this. Um, let's see. In a long post, I thought I had one pulled up that was... Okay, so let's try to parse through some of this. So he said, we are at the end of the call by then, so we agree to reassessing in two weeks. And they were talking about proof of work. Um, one, having two more mainnet shadow forks is what they want, and getting clients supporting and passing hive test uh, suites and fixing the outstanding bugs from the past shadow forks. Um, the May 13th is the next call. So put that on your calculator and it says one more important note on naming specific clients progress. Which one was proof of work? There was a lot here. So maybe I missed it. I thought there was one more about timing and maybe you guys can help me out in chat and then we'll go back to it. Um, in just a second. So. Realistically, what are we talking about from the mining perspective right now? I think we're talking about a very difficult month period, uh, at least for mining profitability. And you need to be pre prepared to bob and weave through all of this um, pretty significantly. I think, I think it's going to be pretty hard to uh, be profitable. You need to get your electric costs down, which is going to be a, a big problem. Um, I think right now we do have to start taking into consideration what other networks are going to be viable. I don't think after talking to Daniel Keller on the interview that they were expecting, obviously he said, we're, we're expecting to take over all the Ethereum hash rate. Sure. Okay, cool. But there's a couple problems with that from a flux perspective. One, AMD cards don't run good on it. Number two, he wasn't really expecting when I quizzed him on, so you'll be ready by June, that they would actually be ready by June. There's a lot more work that needs to be done there. Um, there's other networks, but a lot of them are small. You have Ethereum Classic, but Ethereum Classic still has quite a few tools that need to be put into place before it's really ready. For example, just an NFT marketplace. Yes, there are NFTs on Ethereum Classic, but there's not a marketplace. There's not a centralized marketplace for people that are essentially in need of that. And if we're being honest, like things like, whether you hate it or love it, things like OpenSea are ubiquitous, meaning like just the normies are going into OpenSea. That's gonna be the main marketplace. If you don't have something comparable to that, it's not gonna play out right. So, I think there's there's a lot of issues surrounding what moves end up happening next. Uh, a lot of other algorithms also cause problems. Uh, Ravencoin, for example, really hurts your core. So does Flux. Ergo is a great option, but it really just isn't large enough and it has that weird difficulty delay problem that's going on. Um, you know, we can find problems in all the networks. We will have to see what the miners choose and how much that influences price at the end of the day. I think overall, we can state beyond a shadow of a doubt that even if a ton of miners leave, just overall, they sell their equipment and get out, there will be enough miners around at the end of the day to move to a network, another network. And whatever network that gets the minor support, I will say I think is going to be extremely bullish. So whether that's Ethereum Classic, whether that's Flux, whether that's Ravencoin, choose your coin, what you think is gonna get moved to, and it's gonna be a very bullish move because price discovery will follow that difficulty increase. Uh, maybe not to an extent to keep all of the miners on the network, right? But enough to where from an investment standpoint, not financial advice, because I don't know which coin that would be, but from an investment standpoint could to prove out to be extremely lucrative. Um, now, 
Ethereum, obviously I wanted to talk about the burn that happened over the weekend. There was uh, basically like over 200 million within those three, three hours for the launch that was burned for Ethereum. Pretty insane. Um, that did not translate into an increase of price. I hope you enjoyed this clip from the Crypto Mining Morning Show every Monday through Friday, 7.45 a.m. Pacific and 10.45 a.m. Eastern Time. You can check out more clips here, or if you're interested in checking out the entire live show, you can check that out down here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Tuesday.